Hi, hi, developer Steve. <laughs> yes, how are you going? All known to your friends as Dev Steve, yeah? Well, my name is legally developer Steve, so either one. <laughs> okay, all right, cool. <laughs> I'm good, thank you, yes. Cool. That's a great background you have. Wow. Thank you. I can, um, I've got a lot of these, so I can also be hanging out with Chewy. Nice, <laughs> nice. So I, I didn't know the Hopin platform uh, could enable this, so it's really interesting to see. Yeah. Oh, I can't. I'm using OBS and I've got a green screen. Also two studio spotlights. <laughs> okay. So OB's role, does OB interact or something? Uh, Chewy? No, it is literally Chewy a background is. loop. Yeah, okay. it's literally okay. a background loop. No, I'm using Open Broadcasting System, which is like an open source uh, production platform, I guess. Okay. Production software. Cool. Well, it, but it, I like can, be, it can be done, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it just uses up a lot of CPU on my Mac Pro. <laughs> this one runs a bit better. This is the Jedi Temple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's there's an interesting startup doing this now. I think it's called Um Hum. Um Hum. It's uh, it's producing sort of uh, these sort of interactive backgrounds, so you can overlay slides and all sorts of other stuff as part, you know just one step above zoom nice uh, yeah well this yeah. is this is how we um you know get a bit creative with our video now <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so two of my recent favorites is um when someone's chasing you for deadlines yeah. <laughs> and friday afternoon deployments <laughs> it's also interesting who was chasing you for deadlines right they're obviously not very <laughs> agile they're a bit of a dinosaur right oh yeah i see what you did there <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? It's an old-fashioned project manager. No offense to project true. managers. It's true. Because we have five people online at the moment. Let's see who's online. Uh, I think Mahesh. Oh, what's Mahesh doing there? I don't know if he's a presenter or not. I think he should not be here. Okay. Mahesh. <laughs> I will get rid of Mahesh for now. Bye-bye. Oh, uh, anyway, this is Mitchell, and she goes by a pseudonym. Okay. Oh, and Michelle's talk finishes in one minute, so she might be a few minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she sent my head over right, to stand in. Well, uh, yeah, at least she doesn't have to run between like co uh, conference rooms. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so let's see what we're doing for timing. Okay, we should have started by now. So appreciate everyone's patience as we wait for Michelle. And, uh... All right, while we wait, if anyone's in the chat and you want to hear a developer joke, I have loads of these. So uh, say hi and I will give you some of my bad jokes. <laughs> Maybe I'll just do them anyway, because to fill up time and to make you all face palm. <laughs> well, that would be a good introduction because I know, <laughs> I know that uh, one of the introduction is you love geeking out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I literally got a uh, box of IoT stuff today. Uh, yes, um, I don't know if this is gonna work on camera, but let's give it a go. Yay, IoT bits. <laughs> I was putting that together while watching some of the streams today. Oh, Michelle's here. Hello. Hey, hey, hey Michelle. I have IoT things too. Uh, I can uh, share. <laughs> yes. Yes. I heard you just come from a from a session, so thanks for yes. getting here on time. <laughs> All Thank right. So we are very short of time. This is just a um, really going to be a, a fireside chat, actually. So perhaps the developer Steve, you needed a fireplace in the background. Huh? Oh, I actually <laughs> have one of those. No, I do. <laughs> Okay. Wow. There we go. Amazing. <laughs> okay. So uh, today's uh, really good, interesting. Um, I mean, I'll be handing it over really to uh, developer Steve and, and, and Michelle here. But to set the context, it's um, about how to build great IoT products, okay, and using both software and hardware ecosystems and including IoT. 
So there's this I, IBM and Telstra collaboration and with the development centers, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that. But I, I think the key thing here is uh, we really welcome your participation. I can see nine people on the chat. And, you know, um, this is really for enthusiasts, I think, based on the speakers that we've got. Uh, developer Steve has got uh, loads of experience, what, 20 years, uh, doing so many things, tech evangelist, advocate, um, and working with, you know, you name it, IBM, PayPal, uh, Telstra, so many others. And, and basically enjoys geeking out with people everywhere. And that includes non-tech, I would assume. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> because you never know. We're all going to become sort of citizen developers at some point in time if we aren't already. That's true. Um, not sure if Michelle needs much introduction because I know you've had quite a few <laughs> events around API days and other, other, other things. But Michelle is API developer advocate at Telstra Dev. Um, and she leads engagement with the external developer community. So part of that is the Telstra Dev uh, Innovation Center. Uh, the other part is driving awareness and adoption of emerging technologies. And of course, uh, 5G would be, uh, I, I can't imagine personally how massive that will be. <laughs> People are already going out buying their 5G uh, phones. It's not quite here in, in Singapore though. So interesting thing about Michelle without revealing any more than I need to, is she has a passion for global connectivity. Okay, and enthusiasm for technology as an enabler. So I, I know there's a lot more to you, Michelle. So to get this started without me sort of talking for any further, um, I think we could we could start taking some of the questions if there are any online. But uh, I'll leave it to you guys. I mean, um, the topic here is how can really developers build great IoT products? That would be the umbrella topic. And uh, perhaps we could kick off there with um, with Michelle. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So I, I love this topic, building um, great IoT products from a developer lens. Like I'm just learning myself how complex the IoT ecosystem is, right? And you know, the, the three main things is firstly the devices. Obviously, you have the physical devices that need to make sure that they've got the right sensors attached to them, that you know they're the right level of complexity, so they're not too expensive, they're not too battery hungry, all those important things. Mm -hmm. Um, then you have the network connectivity and um, the talk I just came from was just talking about how to select the right network for the right IoT deployment. So you might want really high performance, you know, low latency, high bandwidth networks, that's where 5G comes in. Um, you might want to be more conservative about your battery consumption or you might be more concerned about your coverage. So that's where you would go with a, a low power wide area network or an NB-IoT network. And then the third part is you know, where the APIs come in and it's the applications and software that's actually drawing the insights from that information. So um, I really liked the keynote yesterday where Mike was talking about it's, it's not just, you know, getting data from your devices and spewing it out onto a dashboard. It's about actually synthesizing that information and making sure it's, it's doing something interesting. So that's the sort of painting the picture of the IoT ecosystem for developers. And it's a lot more complex than, than you think, right? Especially with hardware too, because yeah, like like you were saying, you know, you've got the considerations around battery, but also like literally having a device sitting in the field or many, many, many devices sitting in the field, you've got to worry about things like weatherproofing. Um, and like even some of my you know, good friends, IoT maker friends up in um, Darwin, for example, 55 degree heat as well, because boards melt. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah which um, like from coming from a web background, a web development background, like whole gambit of problems right there that you do, you're building for. Plus then you've got the digital side as well, which you want to make as streamlined as possible. Um, special note too for over the air updates, one of the biggies, because when you have all these millions of devices, thousands of devices, it literally in a field, you don't want to go visit them. <laughs> Yeah, oh, having the, the wireless like remote access to those devices, like you said, if you're somewhere, you know, remote, or if you've just maybe if you're in the cities, but you've just got thousands of devices, you don't want to be digging up roads and getting those devices out from underneath the road again. So yeah, firmware over the air, software over the air updates, so important. Um, and then it's the remote access of that data. So that's where I guess maybe the APIs would come in. So being able to actually extract IoT data from the device. Um, you know, the other option would be you know, on device processing. So for example, you could have artificial intelligence, you know, China machine learning chips like in your device that's doing all the smart things there. 
but again that that adds complexity to the physical device itself so um you know we've already talked about things like making sure that your devices are battery efficient and um can take high temperatures and be weatherproof and things like that but that's where the the software developer developers do actually play a role as well so um you know you can actually make your device use a lot less battery by making sure it doesn't maybe pull to the network every minute when you only need you know if it's a uh, water level sensor, for example, you might want to only know once a day or once every second day. So if you're polling to the network, every time you do that, it's using battery power. Um, so as a developer, making IoT solutions, knowing actually when and where you have to you know, connect back to the network, that can actually save a lot of battery power. Um, also knowing what you have to send in that you know, packet of data. So if you have a network, for example, like NBIoT that has some more inbuilt security, you don't need to be sending, you know, too many things in in that, you know, packet of data. You could just send the raw um, information, right? Um, so yeah, that's sort of where the hardware and software dev sort of comes into play. And I'd be interested to hear if, if anyone on the call here has has experience um, with that, or anyone on the in the chat has experience with those kind of things. Actually, everyone should tell us their favorite board. I have mine because I have many boards, yeah. but um, totally should tell us your favorite board. Favorite board? You mean like like an Arduino? That's a board, right? Uh, yes. Or one of these. <laughs> or one of these. Or oh my gosh. One of Which these. one's your favorite and why? <laughs> I so some, some feedback yeah. coming in here. A hoverboard, right? Is that a technical <laughs> <laughs> No, that kind of board, Ali. <laughs> you you could also say Raspberry Pi. You could also say opening a new board is onboarding. Uh huh. That's my favorite board. Onboarding. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, I think as a moderator, I, ha I have to call out bad jokes, all right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's his specialty. But what's your favorite board, Dev Steve? I actually really like the uh, the MKR NB1500, not just because you're on the call, but um, or the, on the theme. one of those. Um, and the reason why is like sort of I've been doing IoT for a number of years now. So back in 2014, I dug out some old boards to show everyone. So, oh, may not. Oh, yeah, it'll work. Yeah, um, I so can do that. This is the Arduino. Yeah, it's the Yun. 2014. And like this was the thing. Like this was Arduino's first play into connectivity, Wi-Fi. Um, it has a, so I don't like to say that boards aren't that great. I just like to say that they have platform characteristics. We'll go with that one. It works, but like it's got some caveats. But then the same year we had these come out and these are 8266s. So these have Wi-Fi as well. And so these were $70 and then these were six. <laughs> um, just seeing how fast the industry moves. But I mean, it's still Wi-Fi. Like you still need a hotspot or something for it to connect to. Whereas the MKR, series especially that cat in one device like plug it in plug and play anywhere was it four million square kilometers of coverage now for cat in one and no three million and four mm -hmm. million for narrowband yeah i, I do remember, remember my numbers <laughs> well i think i love that you talked about like the the devices are getting smaller and also the cheaper options on the market so for mm -hmm. me like that's really important for like the democratization and access to these iot technologies so it's it's really cool to see that you know we're expecting, you know, the number of IoT devices in the world to, you know, go triple, fivefold in the next five or so years, right? And you can't yeah. just have engineers, you can't just have devs making use of those boards and and assets, right? Um, so having like a rich ecosystem of innovators that are from marketing backgrounds, they're farmers, they might be, you know, experts in wine, they might be experts in whatever field, not necessarily engineers. Um, but that's what we're going to need and having the devices that are smaller and cheaper, but also like open source communities that are out there where, you know, I'm really loving that you can just go and copy and paste code from GitHub. It's not, it's not stealing. It's just being efficient <laughs> um, and open source communities there to really help. Yeah. Go copy paste as long as you contribute back, of course. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. So it's, it's like, yeah, it's, it's becoming more accessible for people that are not necessarily networks engineers and, and things like that, which I think is exciting for us because then we, you know, can have a more diverse community of people adding to the IoT ecosystem. Um, of course, there's risks involved with that when, when people are like not doing the right thing. But I think, um, yeah, getting into the hands of the people that are actually going to use the technology is um, is really good. I think that's a good point too, because back in 2014, we were literally using these for stage demos as like advocates. So you'd connect these things to lights, to kettles, etc. 
And then consumers kind of got a taste for it. And now like you can buy like $50 Wi-Fi connected kettles and ask Google to turn them on in the morning. Um, yeah, so cool to see that now. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely easier. I mean, you've talked about these physical devices coming on stream and tripling. Are there any sort of best practices such, such as they might exist, development practices around software which, which can help facilitate all this? Mm. You, you go ahead there, Steve, though. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, there is. Um, so actually, special mention, I was leaving it for in case this came up, but um, the MKR series in particular is one of the early boards to start having X509 certificates on the board themselves. So, And why that's important is you can do really nice secure handshake with um, a lot of the mainstream brokers or even just your server. So, And why that's important is that way you know that this device that you're wanting to talk to in the field is the device that you're actually wanting to talk to in the field. <laughs> um, but then like being doing things also like securing the firmware or even having tamper detection on um, infield deployed devices, like you can just determine that, um, well, it's being kept safe and no one's downloading manga as we recently saw in the last two months from an IoT device. And that made the news like a few months ago. It was kind of interesting edge case. But um, yeah, I think security, definitely, definitely important. Um, and um, I'll leave you to talk to this one, Michelle, but um, of course, network too, equally as important. Yeah, it's it's about like being efficient. And when we were talking about the boards before, there was a good point in the chat, but it's the right board for the right job, right? That's the same thing when you're developing, is if the right network for the right job that you need to connect with. So um, you know, Dev Steve, you mentioned like some of the old boards were Wi-Fi connected, which is great. You know, if you want something quick and cheap to work with, but if you're deploying something out in the field, it's not really feasible that you're going to have a Wi-Fi network available wherever you want to deploy your IoT device. So that's when you might want to have a you know, cellular network. Um, you talked about security as well. So if you have like a mission critical application that you know either has sensitive information, so it might be you know like sending. I don't know, potentially health data from all the people that are wearing their watches, or it might be the driverless car that's, you know, being able to be controlled, like you wouldn't control over the network, but it's sending information over the network. You'd want a network that's in inherently secure. Um, so a best practice there would be making sure that understanding what actual device, what information you're sending over the network, um, who potentially can have access to that and what they could potentially do with it if they had access to it. So choosing a network like a, for example, the cellular networks that are inherently more secure, then that's something I recommend anyway. But yeah, totally. Yeah. Actually, um, I actually recently got my car connected to a network that has a SIM card in it, and it, and it's got Wi-Fi. Yeah, it's a uh, Land Rover Evoque, which is kind of cool. Because yeah, a whole gambit. Of, well, there's four apps for it, which is kind of fun. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> this is a side note. Yeah, what does um, the car do on the network? Tell me about that. Um, it's got a whole bunch of screens. <laughs> um, no, well, it actually has, um, well, uh, special mention to good friends at Here Technology. So it actually has here, here maps in the car from Here Tech. Um, so I can do over the air updates, live traffic reports. Um, you can uh, warm the car up before you even get to it. Although it's literally like through two door doorways from here. Um, yeah, it, where you can adjust the seats. Like it actually knows based on the key who's getting in or which app gets um, activated. So it'll adjust the seats and mirrors and all the things. It's yeah, kind of cool. <laughs> oh, I love that. No, a car is something that is actually so complex and there's going to be different, um, I guess, connectivities for different applications even within the car. So if you're doing a software update, for example, you might be at home and you can use your Wi-Fi on like your NBN or something. You don't need to have something crazy else connected to it. But if you're out um, driving, you might want to have a lot of that processing done for a connected car on board, right? So you want it to be doing maybe, you know, that lane detection and stuff like that. That wouldn't be going to the cloud and coming back. That would be on the car itself. Whereas a thing like getting information live from the nearest traffic light, that might be over 5G, for example, because that's, you know, two devices connecting to each other, low latency requirements, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, interesting. Well, we, have um, a we have a question. We have a question from Jonathan. From Jonathan. Oh, that, that's me. I was actually replying to. Um, oh, to, Ali. Uh, uh, yeah, Alison, who was talking about Raspberry Pi, and I was kind of curious, saying, "Okay, it's good for operating systems, but could it actually be a board? Could it could it be deployed for for IoT?" <laughs> <laughs> what I, I forgot earlier, they actually just arrived. Yeah, it's a Raspberry Pi B three. Um, 
Yes. Did you want to? I can start with this one if you want, because that's actually for a project. There's six of them down here. Yeah, I haven't used the pie <laughs> before, so you go ahead. Oh, um, yeah, and this sort of comes down to you know right tool, right job as well. Like yeah, like you said, like this comes with a full blown operating system. So um, actually, I can open this other box too, which is a bit fun. Um, the um, the good thing I like about the pies is, yeah, you do get a full blown uh, Linux or an almost full blown Linux operating system. So doing edge detection stuff or even using, this is a LiDAR module that I just got today. I haven't used it yet, but it uh, looks fun. Um, so small, I was expecting it not to be that tiny, but um, yeah, hooking one of these and one of those up means you can, these generate a lot of point cloud data. So you can do a bit more processing power on here and then even package it up send it off to a cloud service, get a response back, et cetera, which is like, it's edge. Um, this is actually for, uh, I can't say yet, but anyway, it's for something fun. Um, the, whereas Arduino, um, I like to think of Arduino and for those developers in the room, um, Arduino is one loop to rule them all in the IoT world. Cause it is literally one loop that just consistently goes, am I doing a thing? Am I doing a thing? Am I doing a thing? Until it hits like a break or a, something that it's supposed to be doing, sending, getting, opening, et cetera, then it like triggers its program. Um, but I think the thing I like about the Pies is they're really, really small. They're really cheap, a um, little bit power hungry. So they generally like to be plugged into some sort of consistent power supply. Um, but yeah, there's so many things. I, I mean, one of my favorite favorite uses uses for one of these. These aren't going to. That's not happening with these ones. But um, is RetroPie. You can actually run emulators on them as well and do all sorts of fun. I love RetroPie. <laughs> so many games. Um, the um, yeah, but I mean, um, so many use cases and a lot of um, open source projects now on the uh, around on GitHub on the internet just building out some really fun stuff. You kind of see something new every day that's literally um, pick up, plug in a memory card, to, like load the, load the um, operating system on and plug it in and off you go. I just saw that. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah, Michelle, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I saw Abhishek um, has joined us and has posted that he uses a Raspberry Pi 2, which is great. And one of the questions that had come through was um, how to get started with the Internet of Things. That might be something we can talk about next, but Jonathan, you, you go ahead. So it's really about using the Raspberry Pi to save cost, right? To put a lot more software on it. It's got a lot of interfaces, right? Ports. Mm. Is it is it like an alternative for prototyping? How how could it be used to sort of take out cost of, of a whole system with software? How would the hardware software weigh up to reduce um, cost? Actually, one of the projects I've seen literally this morning while I was having my coffee <laughs> um, was a, um, and I've seen a few of these, but there's a new one that I want to try. It's um, dashboarding software for, um, well, for anyone really. So uh, if you think of a, of a dev team uh, in an office, if we go back to offices, they have like a big screen with all the issues from their GitHub up on the up on a dashboard. So everyone can see, you know, number of fixes currently in play, number of uh, features that are yet to be looked at. Um, you can have that sort of dashboard, or even like for uh, retail, you can have like you know, sales figures, et cetera, in lunchrooms, like, and really relatively easily too. Like, you just plug this into a HDMI, give it some power, and off it goes. <laughs> Maybe some internet. <laughs> yeah, I think that the cost savings too come from. So, that's a good example of where everything's encapsulated in the device, right? So, these devices actually, they're pretty complex. I can do some good stuff. Um, but then the other option is you treat these as dumb devices that just have sensors connected that just send and receive data. That's or maybe not even receive, just send data. That's all they do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when the onus is a lot on the, the software side for making all the smarts happen up in the cloud somewhere. So, yeah, there's a interesting trade off there. Actually. Special mention to our demo too on your, on your yeah, GitHub. I'll get there. Um, which, um, <laughs> Is was a semi dumb device because it was actually we built it so that it, the server could actually prompt the device to send data back. And why that was important was we didn't hard code any anything into the firmware. If we'd gone down that that route, like it would have meant that um, to do any changes to the frequency that it was sending data backwards in it backwards and forwards. And it was literally like temperature data, like environmental data through an environmental shield. Oh, there's a link. Um, yeah, it, uh, we could actually adjust on the server how often we actually wanted it to run. Um, and 
like during the day we might only wanted to run every half an hour and then at night maybe every hour like we can we had that flexibility to adjust it without deploying new firmware hey better, better get on and ask about the specifics right um, it, you know ibm and telstra sort of specific use cases and 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 demos yeah because apis you, yeah yeah you put the link there yeah i mean um for in terms of the APIs for unlocking the IoT, which you know we should probably get to, yeah. <laughs> um, it, on Telstra oh, yeah. Dev, um, we've got a growing scale, I guess, of APIs that are about IoT. So we pretty much realised that Telstra, like I said in my previous chats, where we sell the SIM cards, right? We sell the connectivity. Um, then we started getting into the device space as well, so selling third-party devices or in-house made IoT devices. Um, and it was really cool because we have great, um, you know, professional services like Telstra Purple who can give you like this off the shelf end to end IoT ecosystem where we've made you the dashboard, we've got you the device, we've got you the connectivity, we've got you like the information coming through, which is great. Off the shelf is awesome. But if you have an existing IoT deployment, you already have, you know, thousands of devices, you want to get a third party device and bring that in and integrate it. You don't want an off-the-shelf dashboard, like a third, fifth dashboard. You want to integrate it in your existing dashboard. So we kind of found, found that um, rather th you have to also provide the off-the-shelf solution. We also have to provide those raw ingredients to developers as well. So our APIs have kind of stemmed from that. So the one, the one example I'm talking about is the track and monitor API, where if you get the device, you not only do you get the device, you get access to your own data through an API. Um, so for me, that was kind of like the eye-opener like okay this is where the internet of things needs api so that you can bring in data securely um, and be able to put it like in your own systems and make sense of it yourself with making putting it into context of other devices as well um, so that's that's the first one and um, some examples i've been thinking about recently this is not we don't have these already but um, the whole paddock to plate scenario where you're thinking right i'm you know, a farmer and i'm growing maybe that's a good example of something needs to keep cold. This is the ice cream, right? It's a horrible example. What's the ice cream? I'm you know, producing ice cream and I need to keep it cold under a certain temperature. If it goes above a certain temperature, it's going to spoil, right? And I'm saying that it's made from 100% Australian milk, you know, from South Australia. So if I'm able to have, you know, sensors that actually can verify that to say, yes, this ice cream was kept at below, you know, negative five degrees, this ice cream did actually travel from South Australia to the port in Sydney where it's going to be shipped off overseas, I can actually expose that really important information to the people that might be able to say, yep, okay, approved through customs, you can ship this out and sell it overseas, right? So that you don't want to be able to expose all of the API, all of the information of your whole end-to-end -end supply chain. You want to be able to expose some data to a third party, and APIs might be the securest way to do that. Um, some of the other APIs we've got are you know, more about abstracting um, data, so the same sort of thing, getting data from your IoT devices with APIs. Um, but what I'll just quickly mention is actually Telstra is looking into abstracting network services as well for APIs. So being able to actually do things with the network via API rather than just getting information from the network, which you know, we already do. So I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> Not sure how much time we've got left, but see if you can take it away. <laughs> we, we have, we have, we have <laughs> no, five minutes left. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, we've got a, uh, we got so many cool products and so many APIs around them all. And pretty much most of the things we have are all API first. So there's so many cool things. I have to pick one. Um, I'm actually going to mention one of my absolute favorites because this, this is like out of this world geekiness and so cool. So we have a virtual assistant in space, uh, actually on the International Space Station. <laughs> yeah, it's called Simon2. So C I M O N 2. And it's uh, literally like this amazing little floating ball thing. It can move itself around in zero G. Like it's so cool. Thanks, Gloria. I love this. I totally want one, but I want one in zero G. Um, but yeah, it helps the astronauts perform their um, activities. So it can give status reports. It can check for things. Yeah, it can move around. it's so cool. Anyway, I would highly recommend checking it out on YouTube because it is by far one of my favorite IoT devices. You could almost say out of this world. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a good joke. Yeah, we have a question. We have a question here. Um, I think uh, Michelle mentioned it earlier, actually. How to get started with IoT and APIs? So lots of great stuff there. Thanks for sharing. How to get started? Yeah, I mean, um, I'll go really quickly because I got started quite recently in the IoT and API space. 
um, I just recommend you go and join your local community. So we have um, like meetups. If people are interested in IoT, we've got the Oz IoT meetup that developer Steve and uh, Ali and I also co-host. Um, so we'll get a link to that in the chat as well. So go online, these open source communities, get one of these little devices like an Arduino or a Pi and just start playing around in the house. What things can you automate and try in the house? Yeah. Um, fun fact, and there's photos on my Flickr if anyone wants to have a look, but I did actually uh, connect my wedding cake a few years ago so that folks could use the, they used the Telstra SMS API to be able to change the colour of the cake at the wedding. It was pretty cool. Things like that, that like fun. finding in your in your own life where like you can maybe have fun or save time or save energy um, and just try and automate that first. You, like you literally you can find resources online. You don't need like an entire engineering degree to be able to get started. So. Um, yeah. Just asking that question, you've come to the right place. <laughs> so, so developer Steve, I, 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 I trying to struggle with that wedding cake IoT. It's pretty hard to swallow, right? Uh, oh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, so we've, we've got a couple of minutes. If I may just summarize, and then we can come on how people can contact you uh, through this event. So just a very uh, one minute summary, if I may, or 30 seconds, is um, unlocking APIs, right? Um, We've talked about why APIs are needed, which is access to devices, remote controls, and choosing the right board for the right jobs. Uh, what else? Um, having the ecosystem, and the ecosystem not just tech, a lot of use cases, and farmers came up quite a lot. I think, is that probably because you're from Adelaide, right? That's something to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just think agri-tech is um, something that's just gonna help all of us, right? Uh, food yeah. is one of Australia's largest exports, mm. obviously like meat and stuff, but also wine. So agri-tech is like, going to affect all of us yeah well it, it... actually i want to just drop in there too with it my favorite open source agri-tech project uh is um farmbot i love farmbot so everyone should check okay. that out then then we talked about the best software development practices i won't go into it but so many things there especially i noted choosing the right network provider and then we talked about different platforms arduino and raspberry pi came up and then we talked about the actual uh, tool toolkits on the uh, github off the shelf and the evolution all right so that's my brief summary not sure if i've missed anything and uh, with that i would say how can people contact you oh okay we're already there <laughs> um, so uh, I'm developer Steve everywhere. So hit me up. In fact, I have developersteve.com. It is actually part of my legal name, but that's a whole other story. And where yes, I'm we are, you know, we're, we're <laughs> the top of the thirty minutes. So that's a whole thing. I think it's, it's a big topic. Thanks very much for covering it in just thirty minutes. What's going to happen now? I, you know, to respect everybody's time, we just finished this round table, but the chat will remain open. So in case the participants are digesting this information, right? And, uh, the chat will be open and if if the speakers can maybe respond to the questions in there for the next uh, 10 minutes or so or however long the chat is open okay Absolutely. thanks for everyone attending thank you so much any parting words oh just so, thanks for having us <laughs> welcome um the thing i always ask is that everyone uses their tech superpowers for good <laughs> don't be evil <laughs> all right thanks okay. to as well in the chat thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, Thank Jonathan. You. Thanks, Steve, as always. Bye. Bye. Thank you.